Number 1. Walters lived in Deerfield, Wisconsin in 2008 and was a junior at the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, studying botany and ethnobotany. She took a vacation to Portland, Oregon in the summer of 2008. She was scheduled to return to Wisconsin and her university classes that fall, but decided to extend her stay because she liked the area. She went to visit friends in Eureka, California. Around that time, she became very interested in spirituality, alternative lifestyles and environmental causes. Walters had kept in regular phone contact with her family during her vacation, but she called less often after her arrival in California. She wasn't working consistently and repeatedly asked her parents for money. Her father sent her $1,000, which she left untouched in her bank account. On the morning of November 12, Walters was found standing on the doorstep of a rural home outside of Arcata, a town near Eureka. She was confused, naked and covered with briar scratches. The homeowner called the police, who took Walters to St. Joseph's Hospital for treatment. She appeared frightened and said someone was after her, but she wouldn't say exactly what had happened to her. She tested negative for drugs, and police decided not to detain her. They took her to the Red Lion Hotel in the 1900 block of 4th Street. She made arrangements with her parents to fly home. She had lost all her identification and was trying to get new documents so she could travel. Walters was last seen on November 14. She went to a copy center, where her mother faxed her some papers to help her obtain new identification. Employees at the copy center stated Walters appeared nervous and paranoid and tried to hide the papers. She has never been heard from again. She was reported missing on November 17. Her backpack, money and identification were found after her disappearance at a spiritual center in Arcata. She often left her belongings there when she went for walks in the Arcata community forest. A private investigator hired by Walter's parents found out she was in a tea ceremony before she was found and taken to the hospital. These ceremonies are illegal in the United States. The participants take ayahuasca, a drink containing two drugs. Harmine, which is legal in the United States, and dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is considered a controlled substance. Ingesting ayahuasca causes vomiting, diarrhea and hallucinations that can last up to 10 hours. It has been known to cause adverse reactions, including episodes of depression or mania, in some people who are predisposed to mental illness. It's unclear whether the tea ceremony is related to Walter's later disappearance. It's uncharacteristic of Walter's to leave without warning or to be out of touch with her family. She enjoys nature and had worked on an organic farm in Stevens Point. She also taught pilates and yoga. Her case remains unsolved. Number 2. Jack was last seen near the Aspen Glen picnic grounds in Big Bear Lake, California between 5 o'clock and 5.30 p.m. on August 6, 1995. He was picnicking there with his younger half-brother, his mother and her live-in boyfriend. Jack had an argument with his mother and her boyfriend that day, and he told a witness he was tired of arguing. He apparently vanished while walking back to where the adults were. An extensive search of the area around the picnic grounds and his nearby home turned up no sign of the child. He has no history of running away. Several days after Jack's disappearance, a friend of his family in Bakersfield, California, received an automated phone call, asking whether she would accept a collect call. She thought she heard Jack's voice on the line when the caller was supposed to identify himself, but the caller hung up before she could speak with him. It has not been confirmed that the caller was Jack. The only other person Jack knew in Bakersfield was his father, who was in prison in 1995. His mother and her boyfriend aren't considered suspects in his disappearance. Jack's father and mother later reconciled and now live in West Virginia. Convicted child killer James Crummel is the prime suspect in Jack's disappearance, as well as the 1979 disappearance of seven-year-old Charles Christopher Francis from Santa Ana, California. He was a violent serial sexual abuser, a record of child molestation dating back to the 1960s. All but one of his known victims were boys in roughly the same age group as Charles and Jack. Crummel lived only a few blocks from Aspen Glen at the time Jack vanished and later told a cellmate he had murdered the child. Authorities believe he may have dumped Jack's body in the ocean. A photo of Crummel is posted with this case summary. In August 1967, he abducted a 14-year-old Wisconsin boy, molested him and beat him almost to death. He served five years of a 30-year sentence for the crime. In 1983, he was convicted of the February 1967 murder of an Arizona boy and sentenced to life in prison, but the conviction was overturned in 1987 because of ineffective counsel. He ended up pleading guilty to kidnapping in the Arizona case and was released later that year. 
In 1997, Crummel was charged with the murder of a 13-year-old neighbor boy, James Wilfred Jamie Trotter. Jamie disappeared in 1979. In 1990, Crummel discovered the teen's skull, but it wasn't identified until 1996. After his murder arrest, investigators approached Crummel about Jack's case, and he offered to confess to Jack's murder if prosecutors would not seek the death penalty for the Trotter murder. The deal was turned down, and Crummel was convicted of Jamie Trotter's murder in 2004 and sentenced to death. In June 2012, he committed suicide on death row by hanging himself with an electric cord. He didn't leave a note. Foul play is suspected in Jack's case due to the circumstances involved in his disappearance, but no one has ever been charged in his case. Number 3 Jack was last seen in Tampa, Florida on August 18, 1997. He left home early that day and made a delivery around 6 a.m. He has never been heard from again. The next day, his white 1989 Dodge van was found abandoned at the Pilot Country Airport, a private airport near State Road 52 and US 41 in Pasco County, Florida. The keys were on the floorboard and there was no sign of Jack. He knows how to fly a plane and he owns several, but he'd been involved in three aviation accidents and his pilot's license was suspended at the time of his disappearance. Jack had made millions of dollars in his real estate career, he was noted as a ruthless businessman. He had a habit of carrying large sums of cash and buying expensive things, including airplanes, on impulse. In spite of his wealth, however, he lived frugally and sometimes even scavenged for food and dumpsters. He and his wife Carol owned wildlife on Easy Street, later called Big Cat Rescue, a 40-acre wildlife park in Citrus Park, Florida, where approximately 200 animals, including about 120 exotic cats as well as otters, llamas, and horses, lived. In June 1997, two months before his disappearance, Jack had sought a temporary domestic violence injunction to remove his wife, Carol, from their home, telling a judge that she had threatened to kill him and told him to be out of the house by June 12. The judge refused to issue the injunction, however. Carol said she asked Jack to go see a psychiatrist, and he went, but only for one appointment, he didn't return for any follow-up visits. She stated he had told her several times that he wanted a divorce, but she didn't think he was being serious. She also denied having ever had a serious argument with him, in spite of what Jack had claimed earlier. After his disappearance, Jack's four children from his first marriage fought with Carol over control of his businesses and property. They believe foul play was involved in his disappearance. Carol refused to cooperate with the police investigation into his disappearance or take a polygraph, saying her attorney had advised against it. All the other members of the family volunteered to take polygraphs. Authorities got reports that Jack was in Costa Rica, where he owned 200 acres of land and several apartment buildings. Earlier in 1997, he had begun transferring ownership of his properties in Florida to Wido Corporation, a Costa Rican company he controlled. Police went to Costa Rica, investigated for five days, and spoke to most of Jack's acquaintances there, but found no evidence that he'd traveled there after his disappearance. The circumstances of his case are unclear. Number 4 Tika and nearly a dozen of her family spent the evening of January 23, 1999, at New Frontier Lane's bowling alley on Center Street in Tacoma, Washington. Tika was last seen playing a race car video game in the arcade section of the alley between 10 o'clock and 10.15 p.m. She was a few feet from her family members and approximately six feet from the building's exit. Tika's mother, Teresa English, said that she turned away for a moment and the child vanished. She has never been seen again. An extensive search of the area produced few clues as to her whereabouts. A witness at the bowling alley told authorities that an unidentified maroon Pontiac Grand Am sped out of the parking lot during the night Tika disappeared. The vehicle may have had four doors and was possibly a late 1980s or early 1990s model with dark tinted windows and a large spoiler. A photograph of a similar car is posted with this case summary. Another witness stated that an unidentified Caucasian man may have followed a child to one of the alley's exits during the night. The individual is described as being in his 30s with shoulder-length brown hair, facial pockmarks, a mustache and a large nose. Investigators do not know if the vehicle or the unidentified man are connected to Tika's case. In November 1998, two months before Tika disappeared, a four-year-old boy was sexually molested in the bathroom at New Frontier Lanes. The suspect had brown curly hair and a beard, and two security guards believed they'd seen him at the bowling alley before, but didn't know his name. 
A few weeks after that, a Caucasian man with brown hair tried to lure a six-year-old boy from the same bowling alley, claiming he was the child's father. Earlier on the day Tika went missing, a man with curly brown hair attempted to take two children from a park less than a mile from the bowling alley. The children's father chased him away, and he fled in a blue 1995 Pontiac Grand Am. The children's father didn't report the incident to the police until three days later, after he found out about Tika's disappearance on the news. No arrests were made in any of these cases, and it's unclear whether they're related to Tika's apparent kidnapping. Tika's biological father was imprisoned at the time of her disappearance and has been ruled out as a suspect in her case. Tika is described as having a quiet, shy personality. She enjoys eating candy, her favorite brand being Starbursts. Foul play is suspected in her case, which remains unsolved. Number 5 Miller and two of her friends, Patricia Blow and Renee Brawl, drove to the Indiana Dunes State Park in Indiana on July 2, 1966. Miller left her home on Rochdale Circle in Lombard, Illinois at approximately 8 a.m., driving her four-door 1955 Buick with Illinois license plates numbered 265 to 487. She picked Blow up from her family's residence on Drury Lane in Westchester, Illinois shortly thereafter. Blow told her mother the women planned to return home early in the evening to allow Brawl time to prepare dinner for her husband. Miller and Blow picked up Brawl from her home on the west side of Chicago, Illinois, and stopped at a drugstore to purchase suntan lotion. The women arrived at the Indiana Dunes State Park at approximately 10 a.m. Miller parked in the park's lot, and the women hiked to a spot approximately 100 yards from the Lake Michigan shoreline. A couple reported seeing the women leave their belongings on the beach at approximately 12 p.m. and enter the lake together. The witnesses saw them speaking to an unidentified man operating a 14- to 16-foot-long white boat with a blue interior and an outboard motor sometime afterwards. The couple reported their observations to a park ranger around dusk when they noticed that the women's belongings were still sitting unclaimed on the beach. The witnesses stated that the women went aboard the boat and headed west with the driver. The women have never been seen again. Miller left her denim shorts, a polo shirt, shoes, a white bathing cap, a comb and her thermos bottle on the beach. The three women's belongings were collected by the ranger the night of their disappearance and stored in the park superintendent's offices until two days later on July 4, 1966. Blow's father called the office on that day, asking if anyone had seen the women. The park rangers soon learned that missing persons reports had been filed for Blow, Miller and Brawl over the weekend in Illinois by their families. The rangers began investigating the park and located Miller's Buick in the parking lot. Her car keys had been located with her belongings, and some items of the women's clothing and other personal effects were still inside the vehicle. The car was apparently parked in its original space from July 2. The park rangers contacted other law enforcement agencies, including the United States Coast Guard. A search for the missing women was initiated on July 5, three days after the women disappeared. Additional witnesses came forward with conflicting stories regarding the women's last known movements, but authorities believe that the first witnesses reports stating that the women were seen boarding a boat were the most reliable. The search was extended to a six-mile stretch of beach west of the state park near the Ogden Dunes later in the week. More witnesses began substantiating the initial reports that the women entered a white boat operated by an unidentified man. Later accounts described the male as in his early 20s with a tanned complexion and dark, wavy hair. He was wearing a beach jacket at the time. A visitor was filming home movies at the state park on July 2 and offered his reels to investigators. The search was immediately narrowed to two boats once authorities viewed the footage. One was a fiberglass 16- to 18-foot-long trimmeron runabout with a three-hull design, which was operated by a man fitting the description of the unidentified driver. Three females matching the missing women were seen aboard the smaller boat in the footage. The second boat identified was a 26 to 28 foot long Trojan cabin cruiser, with three men aboard, along with three women. The cabin cruiser was seen at approximately 3 p.m. three hours after the women entered the smaller vessel. Investigators believe that the women may have been dropped off on the beach by the driver of the smaller boat while he drove back to retrieve two male friends and the cabin cruiser. Blow, Miller and Brawl were reportedly seen eating and walking along the sand dunes after this time. They were approached by another unidentified man, who accompanied them onto the cabin cruiser. Witnesses stated that the cabin cruiser was equipped with a radio telephone antenna, but apparently did not have a name printed on its stern. This final sighting has never been confirmed, but is considered reliable by authorities. 
investigators began researching the women's backgrounds in an attempt to discover if their disappearances were voluntary. Authorities found that there may have been problems in Brawl's marriage, though her family denied it. All three women were horse enthusiasts, which pointed to a possible connection with criminal activity. Blow and Miller met while boarding their horses at the same Illinois stable. Brawl was a high school classmate of Blow's, which is how the three women were connected. Miller was employed as a horse exerciser at Oak Brook Polo Club at the time she vanished. She and Blow were associated with men who had criminal backgrounds in the horse market. Blow suffered a facial injury, possibly caused by a fist, in March 1966, four months before her disappearance. When questioned about it she told her friends she was having problems with horse syndicate people. Miller's friends told authorities that she was three months pregnant in July of 1966 and mentioned entering a home for unwed mothers prior to her disappearance. Blow may have been pregnant as well. The two women's boyfriends were reportedly both married. Another person who visited the beach that day was Ralph Largo Jr. He resembled the boat driver Miller, Blow and Brawl were seen speaking to shortly before they disappeared. He lived with his aunt and uncle in Gary, Indiana. Largo's aunt and uncle performed abortions, which were illegal at the time. One theory about the women's disappearances is that they went with Largo to a larger boat several miles offshore to get abortions for Miller and Blow, and something went wrong with the procedures and the women were killed and dumped into the lake. This theory has not been confirmed. Largo died in Florida in 2009. Blow was a very skilled swimmer who could swim 20 to 30 miles, Miller was thought to possess similar abilities, and Brawl's family stated that she had fair swimming skills. Accidental drowning was considered a possibility in the disappearances, but an unlikely one. There have been many unconfirmed sightings of the three women throughout the years, but leads never surfaced. The boats they were reportedly seen boarding on July 2, 1966, have never been located, nor have the unidentified men spotted on the vessels been seen again. Debris from an apparent boat trek were discovered near the Bailey Generating Station of Northern Indiana Public Service Company on Lake Michigan, shortly after the July 2 disappearances. There were no reports of any missing boats the day the women vanished, and authorities do not know if the debris is connected to their cases. Blow, Miller and Brawl frequently rode horses at tricolor stables in Palatine, Illinois, in 1966. The stables were owned by George Jane, a prominent horse dealer. George and his brother, Silas Jane, were involved in a bitter argument over horse dealing during the mid-1960s. Cheryl Ann Rood, a young woman associated with the horse market, was killed at tricolor stables in June 1965 by a car bomb discovered to be intended for George. George asked Rude to move his Cadillac from the stable entrance, and the bomb exploded. Investigators have explored the possibility that Blow, Miller and or Brawl may have witnessed the bomb being planted one year prior to their disappearances. This theory may explain Blow's odd remarks about her facial injury from March 1966 and the connection to syndicate people. It has never been proven. George and Silas's phone numbers were discovered in the belongings of one of the missing women in 1966. George was killed by a gunshot wound in 1970, Silas was later convicted of conspiracy in his brother's murder and imprisoned. Silas died in 1987, he is also a suspect in the 1977 disappearance and probable murder of Helen Burris Bratch. In 1997, James Bladio was charged with planting the 1965 car bomb that killed Root at George's stable. None of the men have been proven to have been involved with Blow, Miller and Brawl's disappearances, but it does lead to speculation that something may have occurred to cause the three women to vanish. Silas Jane reportedly told a sheriff that he had three bodies buried underneath his residence some time after the women's 1966 disappearances. Law enforcement took the comment seriously and planned to search Silas's property. The sheriff involved was killed in a farming accident before the search took place. As a result, the lead was left cold. The Indiana Dunes State Park where Blow, Miller and Brawl were last seen is now called the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Their cases remain open but inactive and unsolved. Number 6 Alexander was reported missing by his brother from Virginia Beach, Virginia on December 17, 2000. When police questioned his wife, Michelle Renee Smith, she said he'd driven away in her van, a white 1982 Ford with the Virginia license plate number EM2039, on October 15. He never returned, and she said she assumed he simply left her. In 2005, Michelle was charged with Alexander's murder. The charges were brought after an anonymous source told police she had shot him to death while he was sitting on a couch at their townhouse in the 3500 block of Windmill Drive. She then hauled his body away in her van, 
the same van Michelle said Alexander was driving when she last saw him. The anonymous informant told authorities where to find both the couch and the van, and the police recovered them. The couch had a bullet hole in it when they found it. A second source corroborated the shooting story. Alexander and Michelle began dating as teenagers. She gave birth to his first child in 1989, while still in high school, and they married in 1993. Michelle had a second daughter shortly thereafter. The couple moved several times during their marriage. They had a troubled relationship and a history of violent arguments. Michelle had brought assault charges against Alexander before, but always withdrew them. She had been charged with shooting him in 1993, but she claimed self-defense, and the charge was dismissed. Alexander was trying to bring an assault warrant against her at the time of his disappearance. The case against Michelle collapsed, however, after a grand jury found insufficient evidence to indict her. The charges were dropped and she was set free. Alexander's body has never been found. Number 7 Monique Haz was last seen by a neighbor on June 2, 1992 in Moore, Oklahoma. The witness told authorities that she was loading clothes into a blue Chevrolet pickup truck driven by an unidentified Caucasian male. She has never been heard from again. Monique was abused by her biological father, who is now in prison for sex offenses. By 1992, she lived with her mother, Candice Daniels, stepfather, Charles Chuck Daniels, her three siblings and her two half-siblings. She was the oldest child in the family. Her stepfather was a sergeant in the Air Force, and her mother was also in the military. She disappeared while her mother and two of her siblings, Angelique and Brian, were touring with their church choir for a week. When they returned home, Chuck simply said, she's gone again. Angelique would later state that the house, which was normally kept very clean, was in a state of disarray. Beer cans and cigarette butts were lying out, and there was an empty pregnancy test box sitting on the bathroom counter. Monique's parents didn't report her as a missing person because, they said, they believed she had run away from home. She had run away earlier after she became pregnant, and her parents forced her to have an abortion, but her best friend convinced her to return home. In January 1993, Monique's maternal aunt contacted the police to inquire about her case and learned no missing persons report had been filed. She asked Candice about it, and two days later, Candice said Monique had called home and spoken to her younger sister, Angelique, and said she was safe. A week after that, a letter supposedly from Monique, postmarked Dallas, Texas, arrived in the mail. A second letter arrived in September 1993. The letter said Monique had gotten married and given birth to a daughter named Chelsea, and she and her husband and child they were currently in Alaska, but frequently traveled for his job. Nothing further was heard. Monique's aunt asked the police to check the handwriting on the letters and see if it was really hers. The day before Candace was supposed to bring them to the police for the examination, the letters and some other items were stolen in a reported burglary at the Daniels family home. Chuck reportedly said the house was so much better and tranquil in the aftermath of Monique's disappearance. Angelique stated her mother and stepfather seemed to erase Monique from the home, for example, they prohibited their children from talking about their missing sister and had new family portraits taken to replace the displayed ones that had Monique in them. In January 1994, Angelique ran away from home and took a bus to Michigan to live with her aunt. When she left, Candice and Chuck reported her missing immediately. After Angelique arrived at her aunt's home, she filed criminal complaints against her mother and stepfather, alleging physical and mental abuse. Candice and Chuck later pleaded no contest to the charges. Angelique also told the police that Chuck had made her write the letters they said were from Monique and that he drove her to Texas so they could mail them. The phone call had been a fabrication as well. Angelique said Chuck had convinced her to go along with his plan so they could provide reassurance for Candace, who, he said, had become suicidal in the wake of her oldest daughter's disappearance. When the police asked Chuck about Angelique's allegations, he admitted they were all true. Candace finally filed a missing persons report at this time. Neither of them would agree to take a polygraph test about Monique's case. According to Monique's sister and her best friend, Candace and Chuck were very strict, and Monique was often in trouble. One of Monique and Angelique's brothers, Andrew, also alleged there was child abuse in the home. He stated that on the day of Monique's disappearance, she and her stepfather had been fighting. Chuck decided to go on a spontaneous fishing trip with his sons, which was a common event in the family, and told them to say goodbye to Monique. According to Andrew, Chuck only let them say goodbye to her through her cracked bedroom door. When Andrew looked in, he saw Monique sitting cross-legged and unmoving on the floor. She didn't say anything to him. Andrew's younger brother, Charles Daniels Jr., told a different story, 
saying he hugged Monique goodbye and she told him she was sorry she couldn't join them. The others left to go fishing in the rain, without their fishing poles, and according to Andrew, Chuck drove for two hours in one direction, stopped at a fast food restaurant, then drove back home. He parked the car in the garage and left it there with the boys inside for approximately an hour while he was inside the house. Chuck then let the boys inside, told them he was going to look for Monique, and locked them in his bedroom for two days. One of Monique's other brothers recalled this incident and noted that there was an oil barrel in the back of Chuck's truck at the time. When questioned by the media about Monique's siblings' allegations, Chuck and Candace denied them and claimed Angelique was mentally unstable and unreliable and that both she and Andrew have substance abuse issues, something Angelique and Andrew have both denied. Monique's parents, who now live in Florida, have refused to make any further statements. They have not been named as suspects in her case, but police did dig up the yard at their former home to see if Monique was buried there. Her case remains unsolved. Number 8. Monique was last seen at approximately 8 a.m. on March 29, 1990 in Albany, New York. She was leaving for school at the time. Her family resided in an apartment on Washington Avenue. Monique called her mother at work at approximately 12 p.m. and said that she had missed the school bus and would remain at home for the day. Her mother, Annie Graniella, sometimes referred to as Anna Castro, returned to their residence during the evening hours and realized that her daughter had disappeared. Monique has never been heard from again. Graniella waited until over eight hours passed before reporting her daughter as a missing child. She believed that the police department would not accept a report unless Monique had been missing for an extended period of time. As a result, the investigation was stalled and many possible leads had gone cold by the time law enforcement became involved. An adult male acquaintance of Monique's admitted that he had taken her to the State University of New York, SUNY S. Albany campus, five days before her presumed abduction. The man stated that he did not have permission from the girl's mother to drive her to the school. He said that he had seen Monique in a parking lot on Central Avenue in Albany across the street from a former Woolworths department store and felt sorry for her. He purchased snacks for her at the school cafeteria and allegedly admitted that he secretly masturbated while she waited in line. He was questioned by authorities less than 48 hours after Monique's disappearance and signed a typewritten statement. The individual was never charged in connection with her case due to a lack of evidence, but some officials believe he was involved in some manner. The man, who does not have a criminal record, maintains his innocence and claims that portions of his statement were fabricated by investigators. Graniella and Monique relocated to Albany from New York City, New York in the late 1980s after a murder was committed in front of their former residence. Authorities looked into the possibility that someone harmed Monique because they believed she may have witnessed the crime. No evidence was discovered to support the theory. Police also investigated Monique's stepfather, who was imprisoned at the time of her disappearance. Authorities questioned him to see if he'd had any possible altercations with other inmates in the event that someone may have abducted Monique to get revenge towards her stepfather. Investigators determined that his prison sentence was not connected to Monique's disappearance. Both Graniella and Monique's stepfather died of AIDS-related causes after her disappearance. Foul play is possible in her case, which remains unsolved. Thank <laughs> you.